Hey everyone, before I get started, I just want to remind you that if you like my content, hit that like button, subscribe to my channel, and then join the Militiaman and Crew Patreon community by clicking the link in the caption. Hey, good evening everybody. Militiaman and Crew here. It is Thursday the 16th, and we're getting ready to take off this afternoon. There's been some really good information, so I hope you guys stick around with us, stick with, stick with us this evening, because um, I think some of this information is um, really profound and good. Uh, and actually, some of the stuff that has been said by, um, by the Bank of International Settlements, uh, it'll probably wake you up because when, when, those, when the central bank of all central banks starts talking, uh, the world starts to listen. So we're, we're going to get to that. But we've had some things. You saw my last video. Uh, we talked about many things get, gearing up, getting closer and closer to you know, what, what they say they're going to do, and they seem to be doing a lot of things. One of the things that we believe is that there's collectively is that there's uh, specific things that need an exchange rate change. Um, some of these items are the salaries, for instance, that they hadn't been paid. Why did they have they not paid those? Did they, did they actually get loans for those? Um, will those loans be paid back when there's an exchange rate change? Those are questions. Um, is the WTO going? Are they going to have a session? Did did the results from the 11th through the 14th meeting get published published yet? The answer to that is no. Do they have to publish those? No, they don't. Will they publish them eventually? Of course they will. That's just the way it works. Um, the research is complex that goes into that WTO session. Uh, it's not cut and dry. Um, there's specific reasons for why it's not uh, just so cut and dry is because it's sensitive information. You can't just tell people that you're going to do specific things because it's going to uh, could have an effect in the marketplace. It's kind of like having insider information. If everybody knows that uh, you're going to do something and, and they're going to make money, everybody's going to, you know, it's like cattle coming through a fence, man. When it gets tight, it gets gets a lot of pressure. So uh, that's interesting. So another thing is, is that uh, we talked about the salaries, the Kurdistan region. Uh, we talked about uh, a lot of times we've seen data for, for, for months and months and months, about the uh, years even, about the hydrocarbon law. That's for the citizens, and it's, that's a direct relationship to the Constitution, for one, of, of Iraq as a whole. And it's also part of the region, which is the Kurdistan region, and the center, the center being Baghdad. And so those folks have been, you know, working on these uh, different drafts for this hydrocarbon law for, for many, many years. But I think if, if you read back, you'll see that they actually probably have come to some sort of an agreement it just hasn't been hammered out completely public eye yet. And what we also see is that uh, we remember back in March, they shut the oil down in the Kurdistan region going through the uh, Turkish port. Uh, I think it's pronounced Cyan. Uh, but anyway, they are talking about that happening in the coming days, which is actually this week. It could it be at any time? We're just watching to see. But we, we believe, though, that there needs to be an evaluation set which is an exchange rate for them to start pumping the oil. So you haven't seen the, the uh, payments for the salaries. You haven't seen the uh, hydrocarbon law yet. You haven't seen the data and the numbers that needed to be for the WC WTO for a session. Uh, you haven't seen those things yet. And we're going to get to that. So ultimately, you probably all saw an article the other day. I think it was on November 14th. It says that the KRG, which is the Kurdistan Regional Government, yet have yet to agree on a deal in resuming uh, the northern oil output, exports, if you will. Okay, uh, they, they name some specific things. Key points is that the contracts were not acceptable to Baghdad, one item. Uh, Iraq proposed profit sharing formula was another item that was on the table that they hadn't agreed upon, it looks like. And the differences over financial contractual issues still unresolved. Okay, so that was on the 14th. They, they go so far as to say we are serious with our brothers in the region uh, to resume production and export as quickly as possible. I believe that they're, they're looking to do that. Again, they're, they're looking for that. Um, I think they need some more information, uh, not only from uh, Baghdad, but probably from the central bank um, and others that are in the process of uh, these monetary reforms and globally. Okay. 
And so the next thing that they did say was in this article was there was more time is needed to settle lingering financial and contractual issues. And definitely, we won't see oil exports flowing anytime soon. So that's, that's what they said on the 14th. Okay, so what happens next? Well, within a very short period of time, it looks like it's, um, I believe, on the 15th, which was yesterday. It says, after the Baghdad talks, the Kurdistan government confirms its readiness to resume oil exports. So we're talking 24 hours, right? Uh, it says, the prime minister began the paragraph by providing a summary of the talks held between the regional government and the federal government delegation headed by the deputy prime minister uh, for energy affairs and the federal minister of oil, who was in Erbil for several days, right? We know that they've been there. It says that the prime minister confirmed that the regional, the regional government is ready to resume the oil export process as soon as possible, right? Okay, it goes on and on and goes, they're talking about uh, their constitution, respect of the constitutional powers, the rights of the Kurdistan region, and expressing hope that these concerned parties in the federal government will what? Accelerate their steps to complete preparations related to the resumption of the process. All of these things they said within 24 hours, so they go from X to Y, and we're hoping that they'll get to the Z, which is going to be uh, what we're waiting for too. In the second paragraph, it says that the meeting included a presentation of proposals submitted by several ministries regarding the reorganization of the internal revenues, the aim of allocating a percentage of them to implementing projects and providing services. And here's the kicker that I like, I like a lot, is improving the process of digitizing transactions the transactions. Why is that important? Well, if you guys think about this for a minute, they've had some problems with corruption in Iraq. <laughs> I'm not sure if you guys uh, realize it or not, but I, uh, I think you probably do. But improving the process of digitizing transactions, these systems that they have are digital. The ISCETA system uh, at the borders are digital systems. The oil that's going to be pumped into different countries is going to be monitored on a digital platform or it's gonna be traded on different digital platforms. Basically, the framework of an advanced financial and accounting system is getting ready to be underway. So anybody that was involved in uh, some nefarious work in graft and uh, smuggling and all those different things, uh, as you can see, they're not going away from this digital platform. And you're gonna see, when I get to the Bank of International Settlements data, is you're gonna understand that when they're talking about uh, transformations, you're going to realize that uh, the language that they use is uh, uh, all about change, and it's really pretty powerful. It says here, the Council of Ministers also instructed the Supreme Council of Public Finance to take necessary measures regarding the Council of Ministers resolution number 2019, or I should say 219, with the necessity of conducting a monthly review of revenues and expenditures and submitting them to the Ministry of Finance and Economy, the M. OFE, as they would say, without delay. So is that, isn't that what I was just saying, is that they're going to have um, a digital process to monitor the revenues and expenditures and that they need to submit this uh, without delay? Yeah, it's absolutely true. And so that's probably what some of this holdup has been about is that they're not paying attention or they're not willing to expose themselves. I, I think you all did see that there's some uh, scuttlebutt out there and some significant amount of news about uh, uh, the uh, Halabusi was uh, removed from parliament and uh, based on, you know, Ill, not illegal maybe, I would have to say that could be about constitutional um, uh, rules being broken or whatever but anyway uh, unfortunately a person like that in his stature if he's if he's been um, removed from office um, it, the implications are going to be huge and uh, <laughs> that it just has it just goes to show you that there's some things that are happening um, politically and uh, there's been a lot of uh, news that suggested that the man has has some um, some dealings that he's gonna have to defend himself on so we'll, I'll, I'll just leave it at that but also uh, keep in mind that uh, you know the region wants their money uh, they want their salaries uh, the, the citizens want their hydrocarbon law money 
Baghdad wants their money. Everybody wants the system to, to move forward. And I think the common goal is uh, they're ready to go. Uh, they've, they've had their meetings in Herbal. Uh, they've talked about unification with Herbal and private sector, and they did that in June. And then all of a sudden they have uh, Al Sudani was uh, there for a couple of days meeting with uh, the Barzanis. And then back again uh, within the yesterday, the day before, with respect to the deputy prime minister talking about the oil and all these different things. So ultimately, what we're seeing is that um, these meetings that are probably going to be hammered out and there's going to be more to come because of the private sector. There are going to be more meetings, I believe, with the WTO um, in in and on or around the 27th or 28th of this month. But that's going to be about private sector. Now, remember what we talked about, too, was the the uh, the data that came out of the 11th through the 14th WTO in herbal post Sudani showing up um, was part of it was going to be about post accession. And I'll say that because post accession it means that, well, why would you be talking about post accession again when if you haven't have you don't have a session. So I think they've they've come a long way. And just because it doesn't look that way on the WTO's website, remember, like I said, they can't tell you everything, but they will post the data when it's ready to go. And uh, we can see evidence of that, that, that that's going to be the case. So as time goes on, we, we have these other things that happen, which was there was a parliamentary meeting with the directors of the government banks or five banks to discuss uh, specific files that they've expanded. And um, interestingly enough, Wally, are you coming over here? Come on. OK. Yeah. All right. So anyway, back to the parliamentary meeting. Um, the Finance Committee, uh, basically the Al Rafidain, the Al Rashid, Al Sinai, Agricultural, the Al Raqi, Trade, all the government banks. They had a discussion uh, with regard to procedures for managing the currency platform, switching to a digital automation, and facilitating tax procedures. We just talked about the Kurds, that oil. Right. So that's switching to a digital automation that's going to expose people that um, they're going to have to have that asymmetric uh, type of system. Remember, because remember, they're doing on the platform for the currency uh, uh, to, get, to buy the dollar, for instance, you, they needed to know their customer. Right. And they need to know where the money's going and and who, where it's going coming from, where it's going to, what for, how much. Right. Same thing with they're talking about here. Same thing that they're talking about with this hydrocarbon law is that they need to know and have a digitized system, which I believe they, they talk about in there, is uh, to facilitate those revenues, having them the, the uh, internal external revenues uh, and expenditures. They wanted to know that information, the digital systems that they're going to have. Uh, or the electronic systems are going to be able to do that uh, quite quickly. And uh, basically hearing them say switching to a digital and uh, an automated system and facilitating tax procedures. What do we say? We, we already told everybody. They told us that the uh, ice cut system is at play. They told us all the borders have been hooked up and ready to go uh, all the way up to the Kirkuk International Airport. So everybody's ready. Everybody's waiting uh, for a facilitation. Uh, or, uh, well, we're looking for them to start spending some money on the 23, 24, 25 budget. And they haven't done that yet. So uh, we're going to see if they do that within the next couple of days. Um, the next one was that the uh, there was an agreement between to enhance Iraqi bank balances reflected in the price of the dollar. It says here that the Central Bank of Iraq and the representatives of the United States Federal Reserve Bank uh, we're talking about strengthening the Iraqi bank balances in dinars, I mean dollars, and increasing their number. And it's a good step, which will reduce pressure on the dollar in the parallel markets. Look, the bottom line is, is that these guys, all the banks that are legit are going to get the dollar for legitimate reasons, for trade, for all those things that we all know about. Uh, basically, what they're trying to do is restore confidence in the local currency so that the citizens feel uh, reassured that its currency is stronger than the dollar. That's pretty heavy when they say that because they're going reassurance that their their local currency is stronger than the dollar. Well, their 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 currency at eleven or eleven at thirteen ten is not stronger than the dollar. 
So you should have a light bulb that goes on. It says on, uh, they go on, it says Iraq enters into negotiations with the Federal Reserve and local banks uh, and local banks enter to have correspondent banks outside the country. Okay, and this is considered a good step, stressing the need to provide more support and add new banks that have accounts with correspondent banks. So I think what we're trying to say here is what they're trying to say is, is that the, the central bank is going to go to outside the remittances um, that we see on a regular basis and have over the years. Uh, they're going to go to a direct banking system, meaning that all the banks will have what they need to be able to facilitate through platforms lo legitimate direct banking and they'll know their customers, they'll know where the money's coming and going, and it's gonna tamp down that corruption, which is gonna actually restore confidence into the uh, citizens, uh, which I believe is probably already at strength and growing because they know what's coming. But that's true, that the parallel market will probably go away as we know it, especially if in fact, like they say, that uh, they, want to, they want to make them uh, rest assured that their currency is stronger than the dollar. Uh, that's really a powerful situation. Uh, uh, here it says there is a need to restore confidence in the local currency through measures taken by the central bank that include providing foreign currency in local markets. And this will give reassurance to the, to the Iraqi citizen that the local currency is stronger than the dollar. So we, we see many articles coming out about different local currencies or regional currencies that are international coming into play. I think there's a big article out today that I didn't bring out specifically, but it's talking about China having, I think it's 13 banks coming in with their currency. So they're going to be using uh, international currencies that are traded, uh, believe it or not, while well, the Chinese yuan is part of the IMF basket, just like the United States dollar is, just like the euro is, just like the yen is. And a lot of these names you start to recognize that, you know, the British pound is part of that. So that basket, for instance, but they're also talking about other baskets of currencies. And we're talking about the AMF. You guys probably saw articles that are specifically talking about the Arab Monetary Fund. And we're going to get into that in a, in, a, in a brief moment. But the bottom line is they talked about another article that came out that I didn't get a chance to touch on too much because it's just so much data, you guys. But the Buna platform, they're dealing with the G20. The Buna platform is, is a symmetric platform. Okay, and they're going to be working with the G20 and the some of the richest countries in the world, the, the, the strongest currencies in the world happen to be um, with the IMF, Ah, excuse me, the AMF, uh, to be fair, both, but the AMF, okay, the largest in the world or the strongest in the world would be a better term. So anyway, keep your eyes peeled on that because uh, the Buna platform is not going away. Um, it's a digital platform. It's got the same technologies and uh, I believe that they're going to be interlinkable, interlinkable or interlinking with uh, the ISO 200022, which is the 2022, to be fair, everybody. I, I talk a little fast once in a while. Uh, but that system um, has both sides of the component for information and uh, the other side will be like the Buddha platform moving the money, being able to communicate. So um, keep all that in mind. And one other thing is that we had a, we had a little thing that came up just recently. Um, it, and this is, a, you know, just going back just a smidge in time. It is the, the central bank is making intensive efforts through its discussions with the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank to ease restrictions on Iraqi banks, which we're seeing, right, as well as developing practical solutions to liberalize the Iraqi currency by opening outlets in most countries of the world's dealings. So that right there should tell you that they're in a situation where they're gearing to be able to use the dinar outside the country. And uh, that's a good sign. Are they getting ready for um, people to exchange currencies back and forth across borders? I think they are. So it's fascinating and it's good. Here's another thing that says Al, Al Sudani congratulates Iraq's victory in membership of the UNESCO, we'll call it UNESCO, Executive Board. And they're, they're thanking, um, their thanks for the votes from the countries that facilitated this trade. It says here, the uh, uh, Executive Council of UNESCO, which represents the highest scientific and cultural authority in the world, okay? Some highly, you know, decorated people and uh, entities. 
They go on to say that, um, let's see, it says the International Fronts represents a natural entitlement for the beloved country, which gave the world old and new knowledge. Well, we all know Iraq has been around for a long time and, and, and have heavy experience in science and culture. Basically, it also uh, goes to say that the government's policy and program uh, to restore Iraq's position in all international forums. Well, if they're going to jump back into what, to their proper position in all international forums, uh, one of those positions would be their international acceptable exchange rate. It says here, Iraq has officially been selected or elected to the membership of the UNESCO Executive Board after winning the decisive elections during the activities of the 42nd session of the International Conference of UNESCO in Paris after 38 years of waiting. All right, so that's fascinating. These guys uh, are coming back. What they're suggesting is they're hitting the stage running. So they're obviously... They've been voted in after 38 years back to a, uh, another place in their proper position. And, and another article that comes out has a little different twist to it, but it's also about the Executive Council of UNESCO. It says the General Conference of UNESCO in the 42nd session at the United Nations, uh, Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization in Paris, the 7th uh, of this month will continue through the 22nd of this month with the participation of 194 member states of the organization. And it says it's noteworthy that the General Conference discusses many important topics at the international level, including the draft budget for the period of 24-25. I find that very interesting. They're talking about here at the UNESCO, they're bringing up Iraq's budget to the extent which the sustainable development goals are achieved. Well, what is the sustainable development? Well, they're going to be building out their country, reconstruction. So, but they go on to say the member states to achieve this goal, uh, their general policies are also being discussed through the committees of education, the natural sciences, the humanities, social sciences, culture, communication, information, and the legal and financial affairs committee. Okay, Legal and Financial Affairs Committee is being talked about at the UNESCO. So that would be Iraq's uh, finance ministry, would it not? It would be Iraq's judiciary system, would it not? I think it would be. I think it's pretty fascinating. Uh, I think that they're basically getting ready to uh, talk about uh, their memberships of throughout the country uh, and throughout the region and throughout the world. And uh, we're going to watch that unfold. So and speaking of... Um, becoming a shareholder, uh, and we're talking about reconstruction of the country. It says Iraq becomes a shareholder in the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, right? So the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development said on Thursday that Iraq has become the 74th member of a multilateral lender while other countries have applied to join. But Iraq is now a member, a shareholder, if you will. So think about it. You, you have a reconstruction bank coming into Iraq to do reconstruction, and Iraq owns a piece of the pie. And if the stock price goes up, does Iraq make money? I have a feeling that's how that works. So we're going to see. So basically, as I put earlier today, it says, so the European Bank of Reconstruction Development is ready to go with Iraq when the time is right. Well, the, power, the powerful statement to state that uh, the Bank of International Settlements today uh, are talking about regionally and, and globally Iraq going to hit the ground running. It's it's really it's a, it's actually uh, quite phenomenal. Here it is. It says that quote when the time is right, we look forward to starting work in Iraq and applying our experience uh, to developing its economy. That there you have it. Bottom line. So the last article that I want to go for is here is that the um, it's a little bit long but not much, not terribly, but it says the um, Arab. Monetary Fund and the Bank for International Settlements organized the fifth meeting of the Monetary Policy Working Group in the Arab countries. All right. So when was this? Well, they, they told us today, the 16th, that they've had meetings from the 15th and the 16th, which is yesterday and today, and we just learned about it. It says that the Arab Monetary Fund, in cooperation with the Bank of 
uh, International Bank for International Settlements has organized the fifth meeting of the Monetary Policy Action Group in the Arab countries during the period 15, 16, November 2023. Quote, the meetings come under highly complex economic conditions. So this is the Bank of International Settlements using language like this, highly complex economic conditions, punctuated by a range of developments in the global and regional arenas, including fluctuating commodity prices, climate change issues, and financial and banking innovations. It basically states that the meeting aims to review global economic and financial developments and their implications for the management of monetary policy in Arab countries, in addition to discussing a number of aspects related to the role of monetary policy in facing the risks resulting from the repercussions of possible macroeconomic shocks. Okay, so the, so the Bank of International Settlements is saying that they're facing uh, risks that could have be resulting from repercussions of possible macroeconomic shocks. That language is really powerful. The role of the central banks in promoting financial innovations and other topics related to international and regional and economic and financial developments. So you ask yourself, well, what are those things? Uh, they don't go on to say exactly what they are, but I'll tell you straight up, if the central banks of the world are getting information from the Bank of International Settlements, um, it's going to be all hands on deck to pay attention, and they probably are. And today's a Thursday, which is fascinating. It seems like this article could have, looks like it may have came out um, at a time where it's post-banks closures uh, in Iraq. Uh, don't have the time frame on it specifically, but they did not tell you about it on the 15th. They did tell you about it on the 16th. And I think when this article came out, uh, Dear Samson uh, knocks it out of the park with this one uh, and gets it to us. Today, it says the role of the monetary policy in facing the risks. Oh, I went through that, financial developments. Here it is, it says the meeting will be attended by a number of high level officials from central banks and Arab monetary institutions, deputy governors and officials responsible for what? Monetary policy in Arab countries. And it says, in addition to the participation of a number of experts from major foreign central banks, such as the, quote, Federal Reserve Bank, the German Central Bank, the Central Bank of Italy, the Central Bank of Spain, People's Bank of China, experts from major commercial banks, such as Kuwait's Finance House, the Riyadh Bank, First Abu Dhabi Bank, and other leading banks were there also to attend. The two-day meeting uh, was suggested to include a number of sessions on, quote, the latest macroeconomic financial markets in, and market developments in the Arab region. Okay, so you ask yourself, well, what are these major developments that maybe they're not telling us about? Because uh, we do know that there's innovations. We do know that the Buna platform, we do know there's the ice cutter system. We do know all of that. The digital innovations that they're talking about, are they talking about things that are still yet to come? I believe they probably are. It says the monetary policy prospects for major central banks and other implications for central banks in the Arab region. They talk about stagflation, potential risks and policy responses. Stagflation, what are you gonna, what fixes stagflation? Global liquidity fixes that, they need that. So it's not things moving, everything's stagflating, right? Well, what are they gonna do? Change the value of these guys' currencies, all boats rise with, with the tide, like our dear uh, team member Petra likes to say. Um, the stagflation uh, was uh, actually, interestingly, was pointed out by our crew member, Pompey Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Pompey Peter. But the bottom line is um, the climate change. What I think is funny is that the climate change, if they change the value of their, current, uh, of their currency in Iraq and in, in the region, with all boats riding, rising with the tide, I think the monetary policy climate's gonna change in a big way. It goes on to say that the potential role of central banks in promoting financial innovation. So all of these big banks that they just mentioned are gonna be promoting what? A new monetary system that they're gonna bring in. That's how I see it. Uh, it's worthy to mention that one of the outputs of the meetings is a preparation and publication of a document containing working papers on the latest developments at the level of monetary policy, challenges and how to respond to economic shocks in the countries represented in the meeting. I wanna say this one more time, you guys. When the central bank or the Bank of International Settlements, which is the largest bank in the world and is the central bank for central banks, 
is talking like it's worth mentioning, by the way, okay, that one of the outputs of the meeting is the preparation and publication of a document containing working papers on the latest developments at the level of monetary policy, challenges, and how to respond to economic shocks in the countries represented at the meeting. So all these, comp all these banks, all these people, all those folks, they've been told that there's gonna be challenges on how to respond to economic shocks. When you raise the value of currencies in the world or in the region, there's gonna be consequences to that. There's going to be some good possibly and some bad, but they're telling you that we're doing something and you need to be prepared. And that's what they're saying. And that's how I read it. You guys can read the article. OK, it's out by the BIS and the AMF today. Um, and the headline is the Arab Monetary Fund and the Bank for International Settlements organized the fifth meeting of the Monetary Policy Working Group in Arab countries. I highly recommend you read it. And if you don't, uh, well, just sit back and relax because I have a good strong feeling that uh, what they're going to do and how they're going to treat it is phenomenal. In, in our Patreon room, I, I go and give my uh, two cents on, on this. I think I've already said much of it, but uh, Patreon with Militia Man and Crew, our Discord chat room is vibrant. Uh, for all of those that are new, uh, you guys hit that like button if you care. If you like us and if you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel, please do. And if you'd like to help keep that content rolling, uh, you can also use our Venmo, our Zelle, PayPal, etc. All of those things are at your fingertips if you, if you care to keep us rolling. But keep in mind, in our Discord chat room is amazing. Um, it's, tw it's pretty much 24-7. Uh, we have our news hound, uh, Samson, brings in quality information. I bring in analysts analyzing uh, the data quite frequently. Uh, and I do it on the forum. But also note that uh, when you get inside, Gigi, she is an admin. She's very helpful getting people settled in, play by the rules, all that stuff. So thank you so much for everybody for being here tonight. And you know what? Uh, have a great day. Once again, and, guys, don't you. forget to hit that like button if you like this content. Subscribe to the channel or join us at the Militia Man and Crew Patreon community for even more exclusive content. You can also donate to this channel by hitting the links in the banner to help keep this page up and running. Your generous support is greatly appreciated as always. Much, much appreciated. Thank you so much and have a great day.